You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for September 10th, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where we are changing our name to Only Politics in the Cornfield. It's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. Yes, that is our that is our tip of the hat to uh, Martin Short and Steve Martin and Selena Gomez for their excellent work on Only Murders in the Building, which is on Hulu. It's on Hulu, which we are watching and enjoying. It's very well written. It's thoroughly. You know, it's Steve Martin and a bunch of smart people writing it. So it's yeah. It's I will I will say it is so much better than clickbait on Netflix that I can't even. <laughs> begin to tell you and there, yeah. i'm not going to spoil clickbait for you i watched the first four episodes and then the last episode and i just was terribly terribly disappointed so uh, uh and i won't spoil i won't spoil casablanca for the audience i will just say rick shoots the nazi that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> I'm just gonna leave it at that you, you have to fill in the rest for yourself um I, it's a it's a wonderful show and it clearly uh, has its roots tangled up with um 30 Rock with Tina Fey's 30 Rock. Mm -hmm. it's, there's a whole lot of that kind of very smart, very clearly New York um, writers and theater people humor that is just... And and real estate porn. Yeah. It's priceless. Yeah. It's a wonderful show. It's a wonderful yeah. show. And these two guys just, you know, and, and, and her too, the, the age gap works perfectly. It does. For that. And it I, really I does. found it so funny that there's a joke in the show and when they all appeared on uh, Stephen Colbert this week uh, talking about texting versus email. Yeah. And how somehow the old fuddy duddies just use email and sign the emails yes. as if she doesn't know that the email. Oh yes, I know the emails yeah. from you. You don't have to say sincerely yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, that made me think about, uh, middle child who we yeah. had a long conversation with middle child today from college yes we did she's a freshman and yes. uh Doing just well. turned in got back her first greek paper on greek literature mm -hmm. and looking at different kinds of love mm -hmm. in greek literature and uh, she had to write an essay about it and she went to the writing center and got help with her theme and uh, she came back. She called very excited that she got an A on her paper. Yes, she crushed it. She crushed it. And we're so proud of her. Mm -hmm. And um, But what made me think about that is I told her, make sure you tell your grandfather, my dad. Right. Tell, tell grandpa. And she she just right away said, oh, I'll just text him. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, grandpa's 85. Mm -hmm. And he is so good at texting that he yes. has an amazing relationship now with, you know, 19 year old youngest child and well, 19 year old middle child and 18 year old youngest child, mm -hmm. because he has mastered the art of texting and dinosaur emojis and monster emojis. Yeah. And uh, so he's kind of, I think he's sometimes particularly with youngest child who's a high school senior and is never home. No. Um, Busy, very busy. Always with friends, always out in her car, always at newspaper meetings. She's the editor in chief of the school paper. My yeah. children are nothing but accomplished. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is just who they are. Yeah. Uh, nature, nurture, it's all one and the same. It's all good. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, and and activists, both yes, of them are very much so. Very, very much, much so. activists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Make the world a better place. I think I raised them to do that. I think I will take credit for that part. I'm, I'm not <laughs> going to argue the point that the apple has, the apple literally has just fallen right there. <laughs> yeah. Grand, grandpa just has, is in more in touch, I think, with youngest child than I am. Yeah. She, he texts well, her also, every day. So. He's also an, a graphic artist and artist. And he's, yes. so he's got, and he's a scholar. I mean, he really yeah. does understand art history and art and, and he makes, physical art with his hands and and has for decades 
And, and I imagine does emojis the New York Times just... crossword puzzle yeah. and and reads art in America and reads he trashy is... trashy novels from the fifties. Yeah, <laughs> hard boiled crime mentioned... noir thrillers. And <laughs> you, you mentioned that, and I said, "You mean?" And I named the author, and he said, "Yeah, that's yeah, Ed one. McBain. Yeah, Ed, yes. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. the one. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Of yes, course, he's going to read Ed McBain. Ed McBain. Um, he loves to read Ed McBain. So now, now speaking of people who are um, not terribly old, but who are out of their um, age cohort, but still in touch with the youth. And with still the youths of today? Bring in the heat. Bring in the mm-hmm. goddamn heat. You know, a, 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 I want to say an ordinary person, but truly an extraordinary person. You want to talk about Katie Porter and Joe Manchin, didn't you? Yeah. Well, and and a couple things about them, because, and, and I'm sorry if I'm going to skip around our notes a little bit, but sure. Katie Porter today just name checked Joe Manchin multiple times. Yeah. And it was in an interview with um, Stephanie rule mm-hmm. who said, look, Joe Manchin is just Stephanie rule said Joe Manchin is just being a heat shield for a lot of conservatives who mm-hmm. in the Senate who don't want to vote for a $3.5 trillion bill. Right. Everybody remember please that this $3.5 trillion bill is over 10 years. This is not spending that all at once. Anybody who thought it was perfectly okay to keep the the Afghanistan war going for 20 years. I, I'd like to add one thing to that, too. Yeah. Because there's a lot of hysteria on yeah. the, 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 the resistance blogs, you know, or the friendly, or the friendly podcasts. Uh-huh. The people uh-huh. who grudgingly voted for Joe Biden and still hate liberals. Right. Like, but, but we're already spending all this money. You know, we already spent, you know, trillions of dollars on infrastructure. So we're already spending money. I do ask, want to ask them, okay, so when you've paid your mortgage do you just say i've already spent all this money i can't really afford food mm-hmm, or mm-hmm. to to take my children to the doctor which is mm-hmm. actually an actual true thing for most americans for a lot of americans right, right. but it is is that what you say or do you say look there's a lot of things that need to be paid for and i'm going to to the best of my ability pay for them all because they're all important yes roads and bridges are very important child care is very important college education is very important the health and well-being of humans in america is important and these two things do not overlap in their effect. Money spent to build a bridge is not robbing from child care. They're two different things that your party has spent decades disinvesting in because you don't want to spend money on anything that doesn't help your donors. So I don't want to hear about, oh, my God. Are you God, talking to money. Republicans or are you talking to Joe Manchin? Because I'm the- talking to, well, really, that is there a difference at this point? <laughs> is there much of a difference? So it's Joe Manchin. But actually, Katie Porter just shrunk it all down and, and delivered a, a massive charge using simple math. She did. She mm-hmm. said, well, first of all, she called out uh, the the Joe Manchin and Joe Manchin types for diminishing the ability of the IRS to collect billionaires taxes and to right. enforce the law that uh, rich corporations are cheating <laughs> to, mm-hmm. to avoid taxes. To the tune of trillions of dollars. To the tune of trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we're going to accept a pay for argument, which I don't necessarily do that, particularly when you're talking about the war that we just finished. Mm -hmm. um, Nobody talks about how are we going to pay for the next 20 years of the Afghanistan war? We just, you know, that's that's not a factor. And we don't audit the Pentagon still after all these years. Um. It is. There's always money in the banana shack for there is, there is <laughs> for always the Pentagon. Money. There just always is. We can always print more money for them. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to the needs of Main Street, which for some reason the Biden administration is not using the Main Street argument, that's not mm-hmm. part of their lexicon. And I accept that they're doing Build Back Better, and okay, fine. But um, as 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 uh, Katie Porter pointed out, you know, if men if men's economics was affected by childcare the way women's economics is affected by childcare, we would have had this bill pass in the 1950s. In 1948, Absolutely. there would have been universal pre-K mm-hmm. because men would not have tolerated this weight mm-hmm. on their earning ability, mm-hmm. on their ability to educate themselves, on their ability to have a full life. And- The same goes for the concerns of uh, our seniors when it comes to being able to remain in their homes and have at-home health care 
and have those at-home healthcare workers both properly trained and adequately paid. Those are two things that are in this reconciliation bill. And those are primarily women's concerns because women are the ones that outlive their savings and outlive their ability to fully take care of themselves for the most part. I mean, there are, of course, men that also have that situation. Mm -hmm. But uh, the the majority of people that are in uh, nursing homes under Medicaid are women. Mm -hmm. And they would prefer, many of them who are able to, would prefer to stay in their homes for a longer period of time. And all that requires is a investment that will save the taxpayers money. If you're so concerned about fiscal responsibility, the best thing you can do is provide a small amount of investment in making sure seniors can have guardrails in their bathrooms mm-hmm. and a daily check-in for meals and, you know, are you okay? Right. Check-in. Yeah. Um, and then that can be increased over time if you need help with bathing, if you need, you know, it's always bathing, first of all. That's one of the first things that That's people right. need assistance with, mm-hmm. bathing and meals. Um, but bathing in particular is is the most hazardous thing that seniors do in their own homes. And it's really important that they have the structure. And very often it's a simple matter of either a bath to shower conversion or a seat in the shower right? or a guardrail in the shower. A rail, yeah. And, and exactly. you have those things and you're set. Um, so, but these are just investments that if you make that, if you put a, a shower, walk-in shower with a rail and that person can stay in their home for four more years, that's four years of daily nursing care that the taxpayers are not paying for. Right. And if you want, if you're concerned, as, as you said, and as Ms. Porter also said, mm-hmm. if you're really concerned about paying for this shit, spend a little bit of money hiring more people at the IRS, the IRS. Taxes that we are already owed. This is not a new thing. This is simply no. money that has gone uncollected because we decided we didn't want to, we didn't want to burden wealthy corporations and individuals with, uh, with paying their taxes like the rest of us have to. And another great liberal woman, Elizabeth Warren makes the point that, uh, corporations, great many corporations actually technically keep two sets of books, just like the Trump corporation <laughs> does. Yeah. Um, they report profits to their shareholders that are different from what they report to the IRS because they make sure that the, you know, every little jot and tittle that they can deduct from that profit goes in Mm -hmm. their tax report. But on their uh, report to shareholders, it's, Oh no, we've got all this profit. We're massively profitable. Well, and and the the good idea I had on sitting on the crapper today is an asset (laughs) to the company worth millions of dollars. (laughs) All right, can we tax it as such? Oh, no, you can't tax it as such. Although I'm going to tell our shareholders that it's worth $20 million. Yeah. You yeah. know, that was before I flushed. After I flushed, man, <laughs> the ideas just kept coming. I had to sit right back down again, poop out a few more. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Katie Porter is just a great person to have on our team. And uh, that's that's worth That is at Crooks and Liars, and it's worth watching. It is. It absolutely is. Um. We want to congratulate Ten Grain, don't we, Drift Glass? Yeah, he took a hit for the team. He still hasn't caught up with me yet, but he's been <laughs> there. I, I told him today he's just showing off. He's just showing Ten off. Grain is at Mock Paper Scissors. Yes. We love him, and he's a and great he supporter of our podcast. And he, yeah. well, he every time this podcast comes out, he's first off the off the block saying, "I'm listening to this with a cute picture of a dog or a cat or a, an alien listening to us," and is just an incredible supporter. And he he occasionally uh, uh, stops by uh, Crooks and Liars and uh, helps yes, out helps there. Helps out with the blog roundup and yeah. all kinds of things. Yeah. All around good egg. One, one of the, one of the people who, who I'm happy to be on his team or I'm happy to have mm-hmm. on my team. We're all mm-hmm. a team and I'm, I'm, I'm glad he's there. He did the thing you're not supposed to do, uh, <laughs> which was remember stuff uh, because MSNBC is currently in the process of rehabilitating all the shit heels and lunatics um, that, that are friends of people who work there. So uh, this week, Mr. Matthew Dowd went on MSNBC, uh, having, as I mentioned in a previous podcast, completely eradicated his entire Twitter archive. He so deleted can... it, yes. Yeah, all gone, all gone. So no one can call about anything because there's no proof of anything except at my blog where I actually kept track of this shit. Uh, Matthew Dowd said, we should not ever let Republicans have the words pro-life come out of their mouths. They're not pro-life. Now, do I disagree with that? Of course not. It's a very, it's a, it's a, Simple, 
clear statement of fact that every liberal has been saying for as long as I know. Now, this is Matthew Dowd from a source that he can't erase, which is the New York Times in 2013, not 2009, not 2004. Here's Matthew Dowd, political strategist for President George W. Bush. Oh, that's right. He was that, wasn't he? Said that Mr. Perry was on safe ground arguing for abortion restrictions in a conservative state and that to that extent he had a winning issue. Oh, I see. It was a winning issue and it was a safe ground for Republicans to be on when Matthew Dowd was being paid Mm -hmm. by ABC to be Mr. Both Sides Do It and Mr. Analyst and and still wear his conservative hat. Um, Mr. Tengrain put those two things together. (laughs) Uh It's called a tweet. I just tweeted oh. about it and was immediately blocked by Matthew Dowd. Yeah. Because as we know on my blog, um, of course, Matthew Dowd's a coward and of course he's a fraud. But above everything else, Matthew Dowd is a fundamentally ridiculous person. I wonder if he thinks if he blocks it, that means that no one else can see your criticism no. of him. No, it's just, <laughs> it's it's a leak in the bubble. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I there's no, there's zero chance that people who he works with don't know about his shit. Yeah. Because they have high opinions of the many, many good things he has done. And then you bring up all the many, 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 many bad things that he has done. Um, and there's this this resounding silence that comes back. So they know it. It's just mm-hmm. that he's a member of the Savvy Pundit Club. Yeah. And so it is. it is certainly embarrassing to have, you know, disreputable liberals out there on Twitter remembering shit promiscuously and, and posting it, but you just block him and move on. And it, it does him no harm. I mean, every time he says something like this, there is just this gushing outpouring of, you know, here's what the DNC should do. They need to hire Matthew Dowd to do messaging because he knows how to say shit that's really compelling. And my God, he knocked it out of the park again. Uh, and, and, you know, Democrats should listen to Matthew Dowd. I'm like, Republicans listen to Matthew Dowd. Remember, he told them it was okay to be anti-abortion. It was a safe choice and made perfect sense for the states they're in. So it's this idea that he just he just leapt from the head of Zeus yesterday and has no past. And the, the credulous boobs who watch him on TV and have no knowledge of anything he did before just said, oh, today he's a good guy. So he must have always been a good guy. Mm-hmm. Would very mm-hmm. much like to uh, talk to those people about investing in real estate. Or buying a bridge somewhere because yeah. they seem to be willing to give their loyalty to anybody who, without checking any of the fine print, and that's what we're here. That's what we're well, here to do. Well, it's the same way with Democrats who think giving money to Liz Cheney is a good idea. Yeah, you know, well, it uh, just because she has a primary challenger, she's got a war chest, and she's responsible for Guantanamo Bay prison still being open. And I, I'm glad she's right on the January sixth stuff, but. That does not mean Democrats should be giving her money. No. Now, if you're a Democrat in Wyoming and you're very concerned about who's going to be representing you in this Congress, I understand that. And that's mm-hmm. your prerogative. I can't speak to that. You know, you that's your race. And I'm, I'm not going to tell you what to do if you're in Wyoming. Mm-hmm. But if you're outside Wyoming and you're just, oh, I'm, I have to throw money at Liz Cheney because she did something I like. Please do a little more research and find a Democrat to donate to because Liz Cheney doesn't need your money. No, she's a Cheney. She'll always have all the money she needs. And she's, (laughs) and she's a horrible person. I'm going to break it to you right now. She's not a good person. person. Well, and in the, in the Matthew Dowd mode, I want to, I want to sidetrack one second to say Mm -hmm. same network, same thing happening this week. Um, You know how many times Steve Schmidt has shit the bed, right? Uh Uh-huh. Just blew up his own podcast, uh, went on and on about how important it is to to fight for the Democrats, then went to work for Howard Schultz, third-party candidate, because Howard Schultz waved money in front of him. Yeah. And then got hooked up with the Lincoln Project, and there was this huge scandal, the Lincoln Project, and he sort of backed off of that. And he's been kicked off of television like three times. And so, inevitably, Nicole Wallace, who is to him what David Gregory was to Newt Gingrich, this week asked him back. No questions asked. No, no fuss, no muss. And he gets on Twitter and says, I'm really looking forward to Deadline White House and MSNBC with Nicole Wallace. And he's back on television. 
because it doesn't matter how many times you fuck up or you lie or you get caught doing something grifty and, and sketchy. As long as you got a Bush regime dead ender with her own goddamn show on that network or, or a Joe Scarborough on that network, you are never going to be out of work because they will always come to your rescue. The only exception is Mark Halperin. Who did yeah, well, that's, to that's do. a crime within the house. Right. And he right. rubbed his wee-wee on too many people, and that you cannot be forgiven for, even though Mika Brzezinski has tried over and over again to get him back on the air. And that, this makes perfect sense to me, because the savvy pundit club falls apart unless you can protect each other if you fuck up, which is all the time. So, of course, Steve Schmidt has to get back on the air, because if he doesn't get back on the air, Charlie Sykes is going to start sweating a little bit. Like, what happens? I mean, I thought we had a deal. It, you know, Whatever I say, whatever I do, whatever I do on Twitter, whatever I do anywhere... I get to come back, right? I mean, that's the deal, right? Always. And we never discuss my past, right? So just as a, a matter of record, I, I jumped outside of our notes a little bit, but I thought it was interesting that this week, Steve Schmidt's back on MSNBC because mm-hmm. Nicole Wallace works there, period. Now, you want to talk about a much better event on The well, View. Well, I want to not? just dovetail into something that's very related to what you just said about Steve Schmidt. Mm-hmm. Which is just, and it, it's very brief. I just want to point out that um, James Carville was yeah. a political advisor to Ashraf Ghani in Afghanistan to get him elected. This is the guy who ran the Afghan government and escaped with over a hundred million dollars. Mm-hmm. His kids are U.S. You know, pre- in, living within the United States as millionaires. Mm-hmm. And uh, James Carville got a paycheck from that. So yeah. these guys are, you know, I know Drift Glass likes to har- harp on Steve Schmidt and, uh, you know, those folks, uh, the, all, all the guys from the Lincoln Project. Yeah. Who, but but they work in a uh, field. Yes. Where you have to be soulless. No, <laughs> that's I think. No, no. That was always my point. I, it, yeah. I agree with you completely. It's that these people are absolute utter mercenaries. Yeah, exactly. And they don't really this whole this whole pretense that that like Rick Wilson gives a shit about our democracy no. is nonsense. Look yeah. at his Twitter feed prior to 2015 and watch him shitting all over everything you believe in and everyone you care about in a really kind of salty, often racist way. And suddenly he was unemployable inside right. of the Republican right. Party. So it's he became. About, it's all about making sure that that. Uh, Gourmet kitchen is paid for. Yeah. yeah. And, and <laughs> right. you know, and, and what they know for a fact is there'll always be another job. Right. And, you know, right. because there is way too much goddamn money in politics yep. and there are way too many consultants who just, you know, fuck around, find a good candidate, get behind it, pretend that they were responsible for their wins. And then there's assholes like me who come around after the Lincoln Project in 2020 and say, remember when you were going to get rid of uh, uh, Ms. Collins? Yeah, a that was and, going to be your thing, which you were going to clean of, out to Susan Collins from the Senate. Yeah, you have a zero percent vote, uh, a batting average yeah, <laughs> from yeah. 2020. Why are you? And by the way, your candidate before that in any election was Rubio, and then mm-hmm. Cruz, and mm-hmm. then before that Obama kicked your ass, and before that Obama kicked your ass again. So you've lost like for 12 straight years. So why are, is anyone paying you? And secondly, again, on the same subject, because I got into a, a back and forth with a guy named Tom Nichols on, on the Twitter today, or uh, the Twitter uh, on the social media this this week. And and it was that thing about, I know how to win elections, and Rick Wilson's smart, and he knows how to win elections. That was a part of it. But it was, yeah, when you have a base of reprogrammable racist meatheads, Rick Wilson does very well. Mm-hmm. But he did nothing in the Democratic Party because we're not the people he's used to dealing with. Yeah. He's used to dealing with people that he can spin up out of fear of People being gay, people being terrorist lovers, or just subtle and not so subtle racism, and point them at the polls. Well, any moron can do that. But he decided he'd bring those skills to a party that doesn't have a racist, stupid, xenophobic, homophobic base, and try the same, ooh, I hate those guys thing, and it didn't work. Because we're not like the Republican base. So, mm-hmm. And, and but still, his electoral genius, according to MSNBC, knows no bounds. I'm drawing. I'm drawing out our podcast quite a bit by bringing up all this stuff. But you did. You also wrote up Mona Sharon for me this past weekend, and her. She really astonished me. Yeah, I have I, to say, her. I, when you played that clip for me in the kitchen, yeah. I was like, I didn't think that a conservative pundit could 
actually bark orders at the Democratic Party well, and yes. Joe Biden the way she did. Um, do you want to talk about for a minute what she had to say? Sure. Um, she she's on her she has her own podcast under the Bulwark Network, which is a very large group of people who have their own podcasts and they write stuff up and it's basically the Weekly Standard um, under a new banner. It's the same people. It's a lot of the same people. But she got she's very spun up over the fact that Joe Biden is trying to do you know Democrat stuff, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is wrong. And don't you understand the most important voting block you have are as me and these five people sitting here. <laughs> Yes, that's right. The ones you should be fucking paying attention to. And I, I've written about this a million times. She and the rest of these people are our Russian aristocracy. Yeah, I love that analogy. Kicked out of their own fucking country because they didn't know what the hell was going on. The serfs rose up, drove them out, and they landed here on our shores and immediately start barking orders at us in a country well, that- Well, they, ha they have nothing but the mink coat on their back right. in the soup kitchen. It's very sad. It is so and very sad. <laughs> and they have, but they, and, and they lost everything except that- asshole imperious attitude yeah, that, that they can you. bark orders at people right. about where is the meat when no where, people are where being is my tea? why aren't you getting these things yeah and, we're all, <laughs> and, and don't you realize how difficult it was for me to leave the republican party five minutes ago yeah and, and talk about them cruelly yeah. he said yeah we've been doing it for 30 years and you fuckers have been shitting on us for 29 of those years so how about you just shut up because you've been wrong about everything and you go to the kitchen and peel potatoes. That would be yeah, very useful. That'd no, be very useful. I need the spotlight. I need to. I need my unique genius needs to be preserved because I'm still well, go, go fundraise awesome. for Women's Whole Health Care of Texas for a couple yeah. years, Mona. Well, and so she advised yeah. that Joe Biden basically screw over his base. Yep. Because Mike he Murphy he hurt Mike Murphy. <laughs> Mike Murphy said he should because Mike Murphy, another Republican, you know, campaign thug. Uh, argued that in politics, you have to make your base feel a certain amount of pain, you know, because if you give your base everything, they, they, then you're not going to win. Lose. You'll lose if you give your base everything. And, and, yes. uh, and I'm like, it's, and the Joe Biden has been, has been, uh, the left has been basically given everything. And, uh -huh. and, uh -huh. and the rest of us, the never Trumpers, the people who got him elected, uh, you know, have been are, are not being taken seriously enough, and they need to put they're AOC. They're so terrified that they're going to lose their tax cuts. Oh God, the and left has been given yeah. too much power. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's and it's, and why won't Biden just take the win on the first infrastructure bill right. and then just shut right. up and do what we tell him to do? Yeah, and and my reactions were you know multifaceted, which I'm not going to go into now. But one of them was really because I don't remember, I, I don't see Medicare for all anywhere. Nope. I don't see free edu college education, college education anywhere. I don't see a hundred percent commitment to renewable energy anywhere. I don't see a climate. There's a whole bunch of shit. And by the way, Mona, your party, the thing you're terrifying us that they might make a comeback unless we listen to, to your unique genius, your party does nothing but pander to the most degenerate part of your base. I was going to say, you know, that? by the way, president uh, inject bleach and shine a light up your butt. Right will not tell Fox News viewers to go get vaccinated. No. Because he's so fucking cowardly and terrified of that base. And that means that they're getting everything they want. They get everything from them. they want. And yep. so turning around, this is your party, Mona. This is your goddamn party. Mm -hmm. Turning around and coming mm -hmm. to us say, you know what the problem with your party is? You give your you give your base too much. Here's what yeah. you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. You need you to stop make your whole... base feel pain. Right. And give uh what? give, give AC huh? walking papers and start paying more attention to Mike fucking Murphy. All right, he's so let's friend. let's let's cleanse the palate for a moment. Yeah, and um, <laughs> I just want to I just want to say how nice it is uh, to see um, the view trending yeah. on Twitter without it being all about Meghan McCain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have started their twenty fifth season without Meghan, and it is so much more intelligent and uh, thoughtful and uh, substantive. Uh, even though they have conservative women on the panel mm -hmm. who are, are making arguments and talking about them, it's not. But my father, my and, father. do you know, you know who my father all right, is? I'll just shut up forever. Be, will be because you disagree with me and making it, you know, as snipey and uh, anyway, that's yeah. that's over now. Um, and Sunny Hostin, who uh, is an attorney in her own right, by the way, mm -hmm. um, she was talking today about. Um, Ron Death Santis, as she refers to him mm -hmm. as, uh, lying about COVID numbers in the state of Florida. 
Yes. And Joy and Whoopi brought up in conversation, and again, this is this is all being very polite and respectful, but said, uh-huh. you know, this is also what they did to Governor Cuomo. Uh, Governor Cuomo lied about his numbers as well. And Sonny immediately said, I'm not going to both sides this because I'm talking about Ron DeSantis now. <laughs> you get a bumper sticker from the professional left and you yes. get a bumper sticker. Yeah. You get a both sides don't bumper sticker. The second both sides don't bumper sticker, by the way, goes to Claire McCaskill. Yes, it, it does. And uh, location is everything because yeah. she said it to Chuck Todd on Meet yeah. the Press. Oh, he's and never going to I have the he's... quote here. He's this never going to wear those shorts again. He no, never, honestly, never, he's no. never going to wear those shorts again. Uh, talking about the horrific Texas abortion law, mm-hmm. Claire McCaskill said, I really think they've gone too far, and I will not accept both sides on this. This is one party doing this, not both parties. This is not the place for, oh, both sides are a problem. No, one side is a problem, she said. And mm-hmm. she said this right at the beginning of the conversation yeah. on the show. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so what Chuck Todd did without missing a beat is he turned to former Republican Congresswoman Barbara Comstock mm-hmm. and said, what do you think, Barbara? Is Claire Wright is only one side doing this? Uh-huh. And Barbara Comstock went off on a tangent about how polarizing this issue is. <laughs> You know, it polarizes the poles that are separate but equal and apart from things, and you can't get them together. You know, what David Brooks, won't you save us? Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, it's so polarizing uh, sending vigilantes after 13-year-olds that have been raped by their fathers repeatedly. Yeah. yeah, but remember, I saw on the chair that they got speech codes at an imaginary university called Pembroke. So really, aren't both sides of this... Uh, and like, and that's what Chuck, Chuck is such a fucking coward. Yeah. He is so terrified for his job, which clearly is to never, ever, ever stop doing both sides do it. Unless it's about climate change, in which case he will very vigorously announce he's not going to have climate change deniers on, after which he has climate change deniers on and never mentions it again. Absolutely. And doesn't he's discuss a, it. And yeah. doesn't discuss it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. Let's talk about CNN. Yeah. Well, CNN, this is from an alert reader named Paul. Um, and it looks like CNN, specifically Brian Stelter and Oliver Darcy, are trying to turn Biden is doing press conferences wrong into Obama and teleprompters. You know, a nothing story, nothing burger completely that accepts Republican framing so they can spin it up into a big deal and be real grown up journalists like they always wanted to be. <laughs> um, and alert reader Paul says, I get the nightly CNN newsletter put out by Brian Stelter and Oliver Darcy. I don't know if you've ever read it. If not, I just wanted to let you know. About Wednesday's newsletter, which demanded that Joe Biden start holding news conferences, especially in the light of recent speeches he is giving, and that he was told not to answer shouted out questions from the press. What I find disconcerting is that CNN is trying to make a a nothing burger out of this. What is more, there is an undertone of uncritical acceptance of Republican talking points about Biden's mental acuity. And Paul points out that Jen Psaki does these kind of things all the time and experts do this, this kind of stuff all the time. You get to talk to Ron Klain, whatever you want to, cabinet secretaries and a, a bunch of other people. But another example of bashing Biden for nothing, whether it's Collison opining that Biden's presidency is crisis ridden and threatened to fail, or New York Times, Peter Baker and others calling out Biden for mentioning his son's death after four years of BS from Trump, which a lot of the same reporters accepted, an insult, which a lot of the same reporters sat back and took, and interviews with friendly media from Fox and very few with neutral media, where he was and is allowed to spout off lies that are putting American democracy in danger, the nerve of the media to find fault with Biden, when uncalled for, is mind-boggling. Yeah, it's mind-boggling, but it's also completely understandable, completely predictable. Um, Do you mind if I go into a little bit of New York Times conservatism, or do you want to... No, that's fine. Sure, sure. Because there were two stories that folded together very well, uh, both from the pens of two New York Times, real live paid opinion columnists who are both conservative. Mm-hmm. And and this this one was from Ross Douthat. Mm-hmm. I don't want to quote the Douthat column. I do want to mention that one of the writers at the Bulwark, 
that I'm usually very hard on did an mm-hmm. admirable job of deconstructing and taking apart and vivisecting Ross Douthat. And by admirable, I mean it read like a liberal blog from 2006. <laughs> This is, from, this is from listener Tom. I know you're not a fan of the bulwark, but I thought this was pretty good takedown of Ross Douthat. It ends in, with his very drift glassian statement. Thank you, Tom. And this is the quote. Douthat is unable or unwilling to see the rot and illiberalism of his own side clearly, so he downplays the flaws and dangers of the current Republican Party while magnifying those of the left. It's neat, tidy, and comforting, even if it does require the kind of embarrassing rhetorical contortions that result from being repeatedly proven wrong. Absolutely true. And uh, this week, uh, actually yesterday or the day before, um, uh, Brett Stevens, who you might remember as Brett Bug Stevens, um, <laughs> confidently predicted the end of the uh, Biden presidency. Uh, he's pronounced the Biden presidency as a doomed failure, which probably means that Biden will go down in history between Washington and Lincoln. And that Stevens will be on the Bill Maher show within a few weeks. Um, the actual he- uh, the actual headline from Stevens' story is another failed presidency is at hand, and he says Joe Biden was supposed to be the man of the hour, a calming presence exuding decency, moderation, and trust. As a candidate, he sold himself. Blah blah blah. He was not supposed to increase our taxes. That's what he means. Instead, Biden has become an emblem of the hour, headstrong but shaky, ambitious but inept. He seems to be the last person in America to realize that whatever the theoretical merits of the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan might have been, the military intelligence assumptions on which it was built were deeply flawed. The manner in which we evacuated was a national humiliation and a moral betrayal, and the timing was catastrophic. We find ourselves commemorating the first great jihadist victory over America in 2001, right after delivering the second great jihadist victory over America in 2021. Someone's worried about their Northrop Grumman stock. That's, big time. That's Brett fucking Stevens. Absolutely. He's paid by the goddamn New York Times mm-hmm. to, to, to trowel this shit out every goddamn week. Who, who has absented himself? He didn't get kicked off of Twitter like I did. He quit Twitter because people kept pointing out what a numbskull he is and what mm-hmm. an absolutely disingenuous asshole he is. And he decided he didn't want to hear that. And rather than change into someone who isn't those things, he just decided to do what Matthew Dowd does, which is shut out the noise. I don't have to listen to this shit. I'm paid. I got a job. I'm never going to get fired. I have friends in the industry who will always hire me. So who, who the fuck cares? I, and he he and Ross do that coming out with this shit during the same week uh, was, was notable, which is why I noted it. But also, given credit where it's due, one guy at the bulwark pulled the do that column apart and said, yeah, this is bullshit. Mm-hmm. And, and it and it should be called out as bullshit. So kudos to them. Uh, do you want to talk about Peter Baker? Oh, no, you go right ahead. Well, Peter Baker calling out Biden for mentioning his son's death too much. Yeah. Now, I want to make it clear that Peter Baker has announced and uh, announced publicly that he does not vote in elections because no. he has to maintain independence mm-hmm. and neutrality as a journalist. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, one day he'll be one and then it'll come in handy. So, yeah. Went ahead and said, you know, Biden, you know, he, he grieves his son too much. Uh-huh. Uh, and maybe if he didn't do that so much. <laughs> yeah. This is, <laughs> I'm, I, and, and for us to continually go back and say, well, you know, here's what Trump did and remind yeah. people like Peter Baker of what Trump did is, is a pointless exercise. Sure. Because, because they don't it's listen. Peter Baker's yeah. job to make Biden look as bad as Trump. That's his job. Trump yeah. has to be. This is absolutely consistent across all the time I've been following politics. Yeah. Yep. Republicans fuck up really bad and the, and mm-hmm. the media rolls over for it. And mm-hmm. so the next Democratic president has to be as bad or nearly as bad. Um, so they invent things. It's it's like uh, I, I've said this a long time ago. They have one font size for talking about anything. Yeah. Yep. So Donald Trump destroys the country is the same font size as Joe Biden is not giving press conferences enough. Yeah, right. And it's such a fucking circle jerk because um, then multiple people in with blue checks will tweet Peter Baker's article and say, oh, you see what people are talking about? And people are talking people about People are talking about Biden's problem with mm-hmm. grief. I know. Yeah. Um, and I, I did want to just laugh for a minute about this no labels poll 
that was done and mentioned at Talking Points Memo. You just, um, you, you know what? You tell me not to get excited about these things, then you bring them up, Blue Gal. That's I all do. I'm saying. I do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that Mrs. Mark Penn is uh-huh. one of the founders of No Labels. That's uh-huh. that's interesting news. Um, yeah, Penn's wife, Nancy Jacobson, founded and runs No Labels uh, and works to support Penn protégés like Josh Gottheimer. And, and as uh, Talking Points Memo says, this poll that they put out, um, trying to get get to the public opinion on whether Joe Manchin is right to call for a pause right. on the $3.5 trillion uh, Build Back Better plan. Human infrastructure bill. Right? Human infrastructure. <laughs> and and here's, here is the poll question. It asked uh, people who, were, uh, who picked up their phones, uh, do we need a large-scale social welfare spending now? Or do you, quote, favor a strategic pause to understand the implications of spending $3.5 trillion? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then the poll results, because uh, everyone except the Democratic group said, oh, maybe we should pause to think about spending that much money. Oh, you know, the whole drinking and driving at the same time that's that's a bad idea maybe we should pause a moment because clearly spending all these things is reckless and dangerous as... right right mm-hmm. so the poll results were reported as proof mansion is right to pause yeah by uh-huh. axios by axios your friends at axios brought to you by axios Was magst du denn? axios is here to explain the news to you Jesus Christ. <laughs> Axios was purchased by a conservative German outlet in the past two weeks. So, um, and I wanted to take a moment, if you don't mind, do just a cleansing breath because sure. we talked a lot about a lot of good and bad in the media this week. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to bed one night this week uh, in tears. Mm-hmm. And uh, you are always very good to me at those moments to get me back to earth and calm down so I can go back to sleep. And I really appreciate that about our marriage. Thank you very, very much. What she's saying is I put her to sleep. So he put you know. me, well, he, he gets me calmed down so I can sleep and, mm-hmm. and he talks about it very calmly in his radio voice and gets me back to earth. But um, one of the things that um, I've been when I've been corresponding with people about the podcast and so forth, I've always been signing off with chop wood, carry water, Yeah, which is one of my kind of taglines. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, before elections, chop wood, carry water. And after elections, chop wood, carry water. And I think those of us that are kind of earlobe deep in political, uh, the battle yes. all day long, you know, yes. <laughs> the struggle. Having, having to notice what, Laura Ingram is saying and when she's trending is yeah. part of my job. I know. And that can be soul destroying. Mm-hmm. And so there are times at the end of the day when I just get into bed and cry because mm-hmm. what are you going to do? And one of the things you said to me was, you know, you really ought to be worrying about Bosco, our cat. <laughs> 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 and that gave me some perspective of, oh, right. Worry about Bosco. Bosco is fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's fine. He's fine. Bosco but doesn't you, need a damn thing. <laughs> but but you have you have on on many occasions looked across the room at him flopped out on the couch. Yep. <laughs> at, uh, purring loudly, going, "I'm terribly worried about Bosco." I'm terribly terribly worried about Bosco. <laughs> mm-hmm. So worry you about know? Bosco, people. Focus yeah. your worry on Bosco. On Bosco, okay? Because mm-hmm. you know he's the one you should be worried about, and he mm-hmm. would agree with you on that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Bring me, so that bring me just, cheese. That just fish. made me giggle. You just yeah. made me giggle because well, thank yes, you. I'm terribly, terribly worried about Bosco is another tagline of mine. But um, just thinking about what is one thing you can do today or this week or at this moment yeah. that will make the world a better place. Yeah, and focus on that. I, we listen to morning prayer from Canterbury Cathedral every Did morning, you? and mm-hmm. this more and and Dean Robert, who does this, always mentions items in the news and people around the world that we should pray for. Sure. And this morning it was a makeshift. I mean, I just can't get over this. A makeshift hospital in Macedonia caught fire Mm -hmm. and it was a makeshift hospital for severe COVID patients. Yep. It's just on one bad thing on top of another of, 
you know, being in a remote area, having a hospital, having COVID patients, and then the hospital catches on fire. Yeah, it's it, it's it's biblical. It's it is Job. How many things can go wrong? Yeah. How many things can can be horrible? Piled one and, on top of another. And right. what do you do about it? And right. and there's nothing I can do that doesn't come from a position of extreme privilege. Yes. And so I have to humble myself, first of all, and recognize my powerlessness in this situation. And also, what can I do? What, what can, can I, do? and and you know, you and I give five bucks a month to UNHCR, the United mm-hmm. Nations High Commission on Refugees. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I can give. And that's what I can afford to do right now. And so yeah. I, I make sure I do that. Um, and we heard from one of our listeners this week, if, if you don't mind me sharing this, uh, when I was young, I thought it was the big things, the great gestures that changed the world. Then I understood evolution and the true nature regarding the passing of time and realized that the accumulation of small changes are things that I could do. Trying to make the world better, or at least not worse, bit by bit. I worked for 44 years as a lab technician, moving things in the world of methemoglobin research (laughs) a fraction forwards. I made some students a little bit safer and perhaps more tolerant and understanding of older people, meaning me. (laughs) Equally, I changed, and the words and experiences of others impacted me as it should be for all. But unfortunately, that isn't the case for some who simply want the world never to change. So their advantages are always theirs and theirs only. And uh, the scientist who is a podcast listener Mm -hmm. um, works in the field of methemoglobin, which is a kind of hemoglobin that doesn't carry oxygen. You know, it's a very specialized field. I don't know a lot about it, Mm -hmm. but his work has move the needle in blood research, which makes the world a better place. It does. It does. Uh, so um, I was inspired by that. And and I hope that all of you, if things get overwhelming and you just feel like, oh, you know, get off Twitter, first of all, for ju- even for half an hour, yeah. it'll make you feel better <laughs> if you're on Twitter. Get away from social media. Um, turn off the news for a little while and, you know, write a postcard to voters or write a postcard to a friend Yeah, and say, hey, you know, I'm thinking of you or um, figure out uh, on donors choose whether there's a classroom that you could help. One teacher helping one student be able to sit still in class mm-hmm. um, can make for a better day for that student. And you don't know where that will lead. You don't. And um, I, what I'd only add two things to that. Mm-hmm. The first is that we, we watched this, sh- this program called The Chair uh, with oh, yeah. Sandra Oh, which was wonderful. Uh, on um, Netflix. Yeah. On Netflix. Um, and as because kind of- Because my dad and your sister both told us to watch it. Yes. We were right. ordered to watch by many people that we respect and we enjoyed it. And it was um, a woke college campus turns on faculty and 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 all of the backstabbing politics and, and the advancement of the youth and the older professors hanging on for dear life and- the, and I I worked in academia for a while, and I recognize a lot of what goes on there. But for all of the fraught kind of triggering stuff that they were talking about, things getting out of hand really fast and students overreacting and so forth. And it, this idea that we have a we have a role to play that may seem small is is true of everything. This wonderful sentiment about those are our students. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. we need to care for them. We need to show them. We need to teach them. We need to lead them. That's our job. And the idea that at the end of the day, our job is to stay committed and to help out where we can with whatever skills we have. Mm-hmm. The second thing I want to mention is that there's a guy buried near here who had some thoughts on how <laughs> a bunch of a bunch of how, what what the proper role of each individual is. Was he was he a president of the United States he at was, one time? He was a president uh, some number of years back. He was a Republican, um, and he he talked about yes, there there are things that individuals do, and it's important that they do them. But there is a mechanism by which a bunch of people can get together and do the big things that no individual can do individually. Mm-hmm. And he said the legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done that cannot do at all or cannot do so well for themselves 
in their separate and individual capacities. Mm -hmm. That's why we have established governments among men is the original phrase, but among people. Mm -hmm. Government is our instrument for doing the good and important and critical big things that you and I can't do individually. Mm -hmm. And there's one mm -hmm. party that wants to destroy the government. The ability to do the Turn things that we can't do individually. Right. And and I I try to make sure that whatever little contributions I make to the larger picture, they're directed at the idea that that force in America needs to be nullified. Mm -hmm. needs to be mm -hmm. kneecapped, needs to be sequestered until it's not a threat anymore. Because right now, it's the wolf at our throats. Yep. And and you and I feel it every day. And they are against public health. Yeah. Well, and I, I said somewhere earlier that the, the fight over the Affordable Care Act, if you're mm -hmm. from the Republican perspective, is a social experiment. Mm -hmm. Can we get our base to, to risk their own lives, to take their own lives, to put their own lives in jeopardy, just to fuck up a Democratic president? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, yeah, turned out we yeah. could. We could we, these people are so brainwashed and so hate-filled and so completely unreachable by reason that we can turn them loose on a guy who's trying to create a better health care system for everyone and have them come damn near to destroying it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is why, and because these people were never checked, they were never, they were never talked down, they were never, there was never any reckoning for that. Those same people, that same voting base, is now spreading COVID everywhere. Yeah, to and then expecting that it's that it's perfectly okay to go to the hospital for sixteen days or right. thirty days or as long as it takes to save my life. Well, and and once yeah. Republican leaders learned that their voters would be suicide bombers, yes, right, in a literal sense, they said, "Oh, great, bio weapons," as you put it, bio weapons. Yeah. We will now tell them that basically they should spread a plague, amplify a plague to take down the next Democratic president. Mm -hmm. And that's why Brett Stevens can write fucking stupid columns in the paper, because Republican voters are spreading a plague in order to, in order to own the liberals. Right. And it's working. Um, um, we've offered a free vaccine. Yeah. And, and in fact, if you go to certain outlets, you're paid a $5 gift card to get a vaccine. You can win guns and a beer and a truck, yeah. a million dollars, and yeah. we've run out of carrots. Yeah. There are no more carrots in the, in, yeah. in the bag. And so the um, two breaking news stories today, as we're recording on Thursday late in mm -hmm. the day, uh, Joe Biden, we're going to do News Roundup now, by the way. <laughs> Joe Biden has, is now uh, using the uh, muscle of the Labor Department to require employers who have over 100 employees to either require vaccinations or weekly COVID tests mm -hmm. and paid time off to do those things. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. surpassed more than 40 million total cases of the coronavirus, about a fifth of the global total. COVID-19 deaths in the United States have climbed to a seven-day average of about 1,500 people a day. In early July, the seven-day average of daily deaths was in the low 200s. Mm -hmm. uh, the Biden administration will also provide loans for businesses impacted by prolonged pandemic, uh, among other measures. What Joe Biden said today was, our patience is wearing thin and refusal has cost us all. Mm -hmm. And then he added, some of the biggest companies are already requiring this, even Fox News. Yes. Now, that will never make it onto Fox News. <laughs> But I'm very glad that the president of the United States is no longer pretending that this is just some sort of amorphous problem that is shared equally by all. And if we yeah. all just join hands, no, 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 no. This problem is being caused by those fuckers over there. And we need to force them to stop being this way. And there are ways we can do that without strapping them down and injecting them. We can make it really unpleasant for them if they don't, if they're not vaccinated, and if they don't wear masks. And we mm -hmm. should do that. And um, and I still think I as much as I hate to say it, people who have family members like that need to tell them Thanksgiving is canceled. Yeah, we're not coming. Canceled. You're not coming here. No, birthdays, Thanksgiving, weddings, yeah. everything. We're not doing we're not a goddamn seeing thing. You. Right. Um, now everyone knows what happened in Texas. That's been covered to great extent. Um, Jed Legum has an article which has no surprises in it. I'll, I'll include the link uh, at the podcast. But this one paragraph um, shouldn't surprise anyone. The politicians who sponsored Texas's abortion ban are backed by some of the nation's most prominent corporations. These same corporations hold themselves out as champions of women's rights. Isn't that predictable? 
House Republicans are pretending to investigate Hunter Biden's art sale to distract from the actual congressional committees that are sifting through their January 6th insurrection text messages. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Attorney General Merrick Garland said the Justice Department is exploring, quote, all options, unquote, to challenge Texas's restrictive abortion law. And and he came out uh, swinging today mm-hmm. uh, in terms of the vigilante portion of that bill that you yeah. cannot hire average citizens to enforce an unconstitutional abridgment of women's rights. I I I I've said this before. I'll say it again. This is the moment for Quentin Tarantino to come up with bounty law. I'm just yeah, saying. That's right. Just saying. <laughs> Absolutely. I can see a whole thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. An estimated 7.5 million people lost all of their jobless benefits after three federal pandemic unemployment programs expired. Another 3 million more people lost a $300 per week federal supplement to their state unemployment benefits. One third of all Americans currently live in a county that has experienced a weather disaster in the last three months. One third. Another two thirds of Americans live in a place that has experienced a multi-day heat wave. It was the hottest summer on record this year. Yeah. Yep. Yep. The Biden administration outlined a plan for solar energy to supply Mm. 45% of the nation's electricity by 2050. Chuck Schumer, who doesn't usually use this kind of language, told Joe Manchin to fuck right off. Um, (laughs) No, he didn't. No, he, he, in a more polite sense, rejected Joe Manchin's call for a strategic pause on Biden's $3.5 trillion tax and spending package. We're moving full speed ahead, Schumer said. I, I think Joe Manchin is just um, doing whatever it takes to get his name on the local news at yep. in West Virginia that he is putting a monkey wrench in the works for those liberals. Well, and, and if he can do that, then he's happy. For those of you who don't don't remember him, um, Joe Manchin is this generation's Joe Lieberman. Yeah. Uh, with uh, Joe Lieberman is much more smarmy and self-righteous and would whiny. Stab dem- whiny, stab Democrats in the back. And his first loyalty was Bibi Netanyahu. And there was really no second loyalty involved. The Biden administration told 11 officials appointed by Trump to military service academy advisory boards to resign or be dismissed. Womp, the officials womp. asked to resign include Sean Spicer. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Kellyanne Conway and H.R. McMaster and... Uh, several of them were fired because they refused. You know, that was their last stand was mm-hmm. to refuse to resign. Okay, you're fired. Fine, go, leave. Never darken our door again. Here's an exciting political headline. Chris <laughs> Christie has stepped out of Trump's shadow and stokes a 2024 buzz. You know, I love a 2024 buzz, honey. A hand-rolled <laughs> 2024 buzz is excellent. Chris Christie is delivering a major speech on Thursday. That's today. At the Reagan Library, sketching out a vision for the Republican Party after Trump's loss. And here's from the article. Now the two-term former governor is moving on after Trump's 2020 loss. Christie, and this is the phrase that pays, boys and girls, whose forthcoming book is titled Republican Rescue, Saving the Party from Truth Deniers, Conspiracy Theorists, So Far So Good, and the Dangerous Policies of Joe Biden, said he would also speak to uh, Thursday about where we have to go as a party if we're able to uh, win back the voters that we so clearly lost in 2020. That's the one that made me smile. It's the fucking both sides do it. Chris Christie is going to hop on that pony and kill it trying to ride it across the finish line. And he's going to get so <laughs> much. Bridge? Is he going to ride it on a bridge? Across a goddamn bridge where it'll die right in the middle of it. He um, also Didn't he also talk about truth? Being yes. the party that is perceived as we telling the, the truth. We want to be the party that convinces people that we're telling the truth, basically, is what he said. Perceived of. Doesn't want to be the truth telling party, just no. that, you know, he wants to be known for it. Um, yeah. One year ago today, are you, are you talking Thursday, like the day we're recording? Yeah, they, the, today wow. they were recording. Trump encouraged North Carolina vote residents to illegally vote twice once by mail and once in person, to test if, quote, their system's as good as they say it is. Yep. That was just a year ago. Wow. Um, I want to say something, you know, just in, in not in defense of, but just to point out that Republicans are terrible everywhere. Mm-hmm. If, if Donald Trump had listened to Chris Christie 
and hired the people Chris Christie vetted for him for his cabinet Mm -hmm. and his, uh, you know, appointments process. Because Chris Christie had a binder full of names Mm -hmm. that he had vetted each one and had four candidates for each cabinet position that were approved by the Heritage Foundation who and the Cokes and whoever right. needed in the money party to to be okay with. Uh-huh. And if Trump had been less of a grifter and gone along with that, let Mike Pence do all the presidenting and he just went and did rallies every day and yeah. played golf, he'd still be president today. Yes, he would. He absolutely would. There's no doubt in my mind. Yep. Um yep. I I will tell one quick story about my work history. I had an asshole boss. Uh, possibly one of the top three t- most terrible people I ever worked for, um, who came rolling into the department I was working in, was taking the place over, and his advance man came in a weeks in advance. A nice guy, perfectly great, very professional, got along with him great. And uh, it was explained to me that the plan was that the new boss was going to go out and do basically p- PR stuff, mm-hmm. shaking hands, you know, taking bows, cutting ribbons, and and the the actual work of the department would be done by the by this guy mm-hmm. and by the people who knew what the fuck they were doing. That was the plan. Uh-huh. And day one, asshole boss decided he wanted to run everything. Oh gosh, he wanted he was going to get right into shit, and it then he he destroyed the department. Uh-huh. Absolutely uh-huh. destroyed. Drove good people out. His 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 alcoholism, his racism, uh, his mistress visiting him in his office. Oh all yeah, the he had, he's the one yeah. that had the birthday party work birthday party for his mistress. Yeah, <laughs> all the shit you know, all the shit came spilling out. All of it, and he. And he, his 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 move was to double down, always double down, get angrier, get get assholer, and remind everyone I can basically fire you all. Yeah, and, but and I he, mean that really was yeah. uh, one one for the the record books when you have a work birthday party for your girlfriend yeah. who is basically, not your wife. Basically, you're mandating your employees to come and celebrate your mistress's birthday. That was amazing. Like, That's like, an amazing story. Like a month after being invited to your house for Christmas to uh-huh. meet your wife and to meet kids. your wife. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. No, it was it was <laughs> it was just awful. But it was such a clear. This guy has no goddamn business, but he could have run that department for years if he had just he done let, ribbon cuttings. Just let the let. But he yeah. thought he was smart. Yeah. He thought he was smarter than everybody else because yep. I have the job now. I must be smarter than everybody else. And oh, he was not. <laughs> Very much was not. Um, speaking, and of we Chicago, have some local news to talk yeah. about. Uh, this was on Facebook, and and just I love that someone point posted this on Facebook mm-hmm. because I would like to nail this story to the door of every white owned bungalow in the city of Springfield. There is this myth in Springfield that Chicago takes all of the money, all of the money. Oh, it all goes to Chicago. All my taxes go to Chicago and Chicago, by the way, is a euphemism for the N word for a lot of people. It clearly is. And there are people in this town in organized fashion who, who have talked about seceding from Illinois. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's it's, it's a it's it's a uh, you know microcosm of the whole nation. It is in that you know the Confederacy thinks all our tax dollars go to Washington and New York, and actually those are the New York and California are the funders of everything that goes on south of the Mason yeah. Dixon line, right? Um, but this this article said a popular belief is that when it comes to state funding, Chicago gets all the public money. But a recent study found that downstate counties for the most part, get back more than what they send to Springfield, the state capital. Mm-hmm. Every dollar St. Clair County sends to state coffers, it receives a dollar thirteen back. Madison County receives a dollar ten back. In more rural counties, it's even more. Clinton County gets two dollars and forty two cents back, and Randolph County gets three dollars and eight cents back for every dollar it sends to the state capital. Goddamn moochers is what I say. Unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now, you have a headline from today's paper that you I, wanted I, I, to share. I want to compare and contrast two headlines. One is from the Blooming to Normal Pantograph, and one is from our local rag, uh, <laughs> which is, you know, four, uh, as I've mentioned before, four pages long. Two of them are sports and obituaries and a bunch of rip and read stuff from places that are far away from where we live. For example, this is the, this is the best one this week, hands down. Uh, the headline is, Wisconsin Cranberry Harvest About Average. That's it. That was a headline. That was, Wisconsin like, cranberry harvest about average. I'm like, okay, so it's from Wisconsin. It's about cranberries. 
and the news is that there's no news. Well, let's <laughs> let's run with it, Jimmy. That's that's that'll turn them, that'll that'll turn the world on its ear. And like you know what, it, I get the fact that you fired all of your reporters and you've downsized and 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 you basically the, the building itself has been up for sale for two years. There really is no local paper. There's a ghost but of look it. On the, it. Look on the bright side, Drift Glass. Uh-huh. There's no shortage of Wisconsin cranberries. That's true. That's, I was worried about that for about a minute because <laughs> what with Thanksgiving coming up and everyone having to have separate Thanksgivings because of COVID <laughs> assholes, thank you very much. But it's about average. So, you know, don't don't you worry your pretty little heads about the cranberry situation. Uh, by the way, cranberry situation was the name of my high school garage. <laughs> um, anyway... That's a fairly typical, I don't know why this got reported, but just north of us, there is another newspaper in a town, uh, in, in a area, the Bloomington Normal area called the Bloomington Normal Panagraph, that has a long, detailed article with the following headline, what an Illinois redistricting expert thinks of Democrats' new maps. And it goes on for pages and pages, an interview, an in-depth interview of how redistricting was done, what the net results will be what the projections are for, for and honestly, just between you and me, since no conservatives ever listened to this podcast, except for Charlie Sykes and Tom Nichols. But other than those two guys, nobody listens to this podcast who isn't a liberal. A lot of the Democrat remapping was to pit Republicans against each other. Yes. Yes, it was. And fight over the same district. Yeah. Um, which I- Because I we lost a seat. I mean, that's the thing. We lost a seat. So the seat that's going to get lost- the Democratic Party who runs Illinois wanted that seat to be a Republican seat that gets lost. Well, not just that. They're, they're predicting a, a large pickup at the state legislature level because the district lines, have a lot of them have been redrawn mm-hmm. to put two Republicans in the same district. In the state house, you mean? Yes. Yes. So okay. That, okay. Yeah, at the state house level, at the, this is the, the bench. See. This is the place yeah. where they're coming from. That There's a whole lot of districts where Republicans now have to run against their neighbor who's right. also an asshole Republican mm-hmm. for the seat that now exists there in, at the state legislature. Okay. And, but it goes into great detail as that what happened, why it happened, what the map looks like and what the implications are five years from now, 10 years from now. And which is actual news. Yes. It's is, interesting. Is the, uh, you know, even if you're not a political junkie, like we are, but that's going to affect your, who represents you, yeah, especially you downstate. Yeah. yeah. Where it's all Republicans, yeah, and it's it's kind of important, and it, it's sort of the future of the state and how it's going to look. And I mean, we personally know our state senator. We do, we and do. he's a Romney Republican. Yes, he is. Oh, and, I uh, mean, yeah. And well, I, I make a joke that my last political contribution was to him. Oh, because um, you gave him a quarter for the parking I meter. I did. <laughs> I ran into him in front of the post office. I know the guy. You know, he's an affable gentleman. Yeah, uh, he had his campaign truck out front. He had to run in and and didn't have money for the meter back when we paid for meters in Springfield, and I loaned him a quarter, oh and that God. is the last contribution I will ever make to a Republican candidate <laughs> ever. Uh, On that but, note, <laughs> but I can say that I did it. So there we go. On that note, mm-hmm. each week we post our Facebook page and website at Internet Kitty, sent in by you, the listeners. But this week's Internet Kitty are a pair of beautiful boxer dogs, Leroy and Ellie. Leroy and Ellie are from Texas, and they had the very important job of keeping their humans warm during the deep freeze power outage of February. And I want to correct uh, something I said on podcast 611, if you want to go back and listen. I said the deep freeze and the power outages in Texas were in January. They were in February. Yes. All right. Um, Leroy is an older dog, and his vision is not what it used to be. But Ellie says, don't worry, Leroy, let's just sit on the big bed together, which is so nice. So Ellie takes care of Leroy. And Leroy, like I said, he's got some vision impairments, but that's okay. And Leroy and Ellie eat freshly poured dog food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store direct, your pets will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Leroy and Ellie. They are really sweet dogs sitting on the big bed at our Facebook page and website. And you can send your internet kitty dog or other pet to us at our email address, prolefpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! 
Let her on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag fire to joy already. Just do it. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job, and it's a labor of love. And I want to thank everyone who donated to the GoFundMe to pay my medical bills. We reached our goal. Yay! Yay! What a burden lifted from my shoulders, and I am so, so grateful to you. Thank you. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information. Merch, we've got both sides, no bumper stickers. We do. All of it is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Also, if you would rate and review our show, if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts, we would really appreciate that. Mm Mm-hmm. That helps us out. Smash that like button. Smash that like button on YouTube if you listen there. That's right. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, Blue Gal, the Internet Kitties have purchased 30 cases of cat dewormer in anticipation of the next quack COVID cure. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying, the shooting and the dying, and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional F Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.